The global energy crisis, which was caused largely by Western sanctions on Russia and the NATO proxy war in Ukraine, is doing serious damage to the European economy. And we see that Europe is desperate to find new sources of energy. This is highly motivating European leaders to recognize the real constitutional president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro. And we see even the United States inching toward admitting the fact that its puppet Juan Guaido does not control anything and Maduro is the real elected president. There was a historic example of this in Egypt this November at the COP27, that's the UN Climate Change Conference. And we saw that France's president, Emmanuel Macron, and the U.S. Special Climate Envoy for the Biden administration, John Kerry, and also the Prime Minister of Portugal, all met with Nicolas Maduro and had very friendly discussions with him. This is extremely interesting because as recently as a few weeks ago, the U.S. State Department was still referring to uh, Guaido as fake president, despite the fact that Juan Guaido has never participated in a presidential election in Venezuela. He never won a single vote to be so-called president. And yet the Biden administration up until now on paper still recognizes Guaido as the fake president. Well, Europe is much more desperate. The U.S. is still actually the world's largest oil producer and it has large oil reserves. Europe doesn't. Europe is very heavily dependent on energy imports. And December 5th is the final deadline for the European Union to no longer import Russian crude oil. That means that it is scrambling to find new sources of energy as winter comes. And the price of oil is already very high. The US and Europe have tried to pressure Saudi Arabia and the OPEC plus countries to increase oil production in order to drop prices in the global market. And Saudi Arabia told Biden no. And it's not in the interest of OPEC plus oil producing nations to increase production because then they would lose money. So the US is trying to force other countries and Europe is trying to force other countries to lose money by producing too much oil to drop the price of oil in order to save its own economy. And Emmanuel Macron, who fancies himself kind of a new child de Gaulle figure, he, he tries to maintain uh, this, this veneer of having an independent foreign policy from Washington, although he pretty much always just follows Washington. But there was this incredible video that went viral showing Macron meeting with President Maduro at the COP27 UN Climate Change Conference. And in this video, <laughs> Macron, now that he's desperate for Venezuelan energy, is very respectful. There's no criticism of Venezuela, of alleged human rights violations or any of that. He is saying that we want to talk, we should have a call soon. And Macron was not the only European leader doing this. This video shows the Prime Minister of Portugal, Antonio Costa, had a very friendly discussion with Nicolas Maduro. And once again, it is about the price of oil and inflation. So it's very obvious what this is about. These Western leaders want access to cheap Venezuelan oil. And they also simply want Venezuela to produce more oil. So the price of oil in the global market decreases. Now, it's not just European leaders who had these friendly discussions with Maduro, even as I mentioned, the US special climate envoy for the Biden administration, John Kerry. Let's not forget John Kerry was former secretary of state and he also was a presidential candidate. And you can see him also shaking hands and having a friendly discussion with President Nicolas Maduro at the UN climate change conference. This is once again, historic. Because if you go look at the statements from the State Department, and of course, I should say that the, the CIA agent turned State Department spokesman Ned Price downplayed this meeting and said it doesn't represent any significant shift. And he claimed that Maduro, he, he, he laid a trap and he surprised Kerry or whatever. 
But anyway, the point is, if you look at statements from the U.S. State Department, just in the past few months, you can see they still pretend that this Trump-appointed coup puppet, Guaido, is so-called president. This is a tweet from U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken from June, just a few months ago. He refers to Guaido as so-called interim president. And he says that we should stand for democracy, despite the fact that Guaido, once again, never participated in a presidential election. He never won a single vote to be president. And in another tweet from May, Blinken said he spoke with Guaido to reiterate U.S. support. So this, the, the Biden administration has continued the Trump administration's policy of recognizing this puppet. Here is Joe Biden, and he has tweeted about speaking with Juan Guaido and reaffirming support, reaffirming support for Guaido. In 2019, of course, before he was president, he said the U.S. must stand with the National Assembly and Guaido in their efforts to restore democracy. Back in February 2019, at the beginning of the coup, the U.S.-led coup attempt, the U international community must support Juan Guaido. So the U.S. continues to pretend this puppet who never controlled anything in Venezuela, is leader, well, actually, it really needs oil from Venezuela. Here are tweets from Emmanuel Macron, the French president. As recently as 2020, he said he had a constructive exchange with Juan Guaido, he said, who he said was re-elected to the presidency of the National Assembly of Venezuela. And you can see him in a photo on his Twitter account shaking hands. And he even tweeted... In French, uh, he even tweeted in Spanish. I mean, most of his tweets are in French, but he also tweeted some, he made some tweets in, in Spanish saying France recognizes Guaido as interim president. So this is a joke. And it, and, it, and it shows that at the end of the day, all of the fake claims of human rights violations and all of that, that, that was all just public relations. It was propaganda to demonize Venezuela, to justify a U.S.-led, Europe-backed coup attempt to overthrow the elected government of Venezuela. Now, I've done many episodes about this. I have articles about this. I did a very lengthy episode about the Donald Trump's national, uh, his neoconservative national security advisor, John Bolton, a hardcore neocon, neocon warmonger. He was in one of the architects of the Iraq war. And in his memoir, which... I teared my hair out reading. He talked openly, his entire chapter, about the U.S. coup attempt in Venezuela. I have a very lengthy episode about that. I will link to that in the description below. I have also talked about the, uh, the illegal sanctions that the U.S. imposed on Venezuela and the embargo and blockade that have devastated the Venezuelan economy and led to tens of thousands of Venezuelan civilian deaths. I have talked a, a great length about the U.S.-backed failed invasion of Venezuela in May 2020, so-called Operation Gideon, sometimes jokingly called Bay of Piglets, and how the CIA supported that failed invasion. I will also link to that in the description below. I'm not going to spend a ton of time going over that. You can check out my other videos and podcasts and articles. But what I do want to highlight here is Venezuela's oil production, which is recovering despite the illegal, murderous U.S. sanctions on Venezuela. And Venezuela is one of the most heavily sanctioned countries in history. Now Russia is the most sanctioned, and the DPRK has been sanctioned for many decades. But Venezuela and Cuba are some of the most sanctioned countries in history. And in the case of Venezuela, which relies very heavily on oil exports, this has done significant damage to the Venezuelan economy. Now, I'm going to look at a report from 2019 in May, from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, EIA. It claims to be independent, but it's basically an arm of the U.S. government. And you, you can see the data here. This is basically them boasting that the sanctions that they imposed on Venezuela caused Venezuelan oil production to fall to the lowest level since 2003. And what happened in 2003? In 2002, there was a briefly successful U.S.-backed military coup backed by the, led by at that time by the George Bush administration that 
briefly overthrew the elected president, uh, Hugo Chavez, and he was so popular that the masses of Venezuelan working people filled the streets and demanded that he return to power. The U.S. tried to impose this puppet who tried to privatize everything and pass these neoliberal reforms uh, named Pedro Carmona. And, uh, you know, he, the U.S. basically tried to do a Juan Guaido strategy back in 2002, and it failed. And then in 2003, there was an oil lockout, a, a protest by the capitalist elements and their loyalists to try to overthrow uh, Chavez again. So that's what led to the drop of oil production significantly in 2003. And if you look at this graph, ever since the U.S. began imposing sanctions on Venezuela around 2016, oil production declined and declined and declined. And especially after 2019, when the U.S. recognized Juan Guaido as fake president and imposed the full-on embargo. Trump declared a full-on embargo on Venezuela in August of 2019. I remember very vividly, I was in Venezuela at the time, and it caused very serious economic difficulties in the country. I mean, it, the U.S. has been waging a full-on economic war on Venezuela. And you can see that oil production was very consistent for many years until the illegal U.S. sanctions. And you can see that Venezuela had previously sent a lot of its oil to China and India, but ironically, the top purchaser of Venezuelan oil was the United States. And then the United States put the embargo on Venezuela and stopped buying Venezuelan oil. So this explains the very significant economic problems in Venezuela. It's not because socialism always fails. It's because it has been under economic attack by the world's largest superpower, the United States. And we can see another graph here that is also from the EIA. Again, this is basically an arm of the U.S. government. And this data shows Venezuela's oil production going through 2020. And you can see it dropped close to zero with these brutal, I mean, the, the crude oil production, it didn't, it didn't get all the way to zero, but the oil rigs came down to zero and it's, the production came down very, very low. Um, on the left hand of this graph, you can see it's thousands of barrel, barrels per day. So originally it was producing 2.5 million per day around, two, around 2016. And then that dropped with all the sanctions and all the sanctions and the blockade and the embargo. And then by uh, mid to late 2020, it was producing around 300,000 barrels per day. So a small fraction of what it had previously been. This is another very interesting graph that shows Venezuela's oil production throughout time and with different administrations. And what's also interesting about this graph is the green line shows imports. And this is an important element to understand how the U.S. economic war sabotaged the Venezuelan economy. You can see that in general, the, that so on the left hand of this graph is inflation. In general, Venezuela has had pretty significant inflation going back to the 1980s, regardless of who is president. Hugo Chavez did not come to power until 1999, and inflation was pretty consistent. But what happened in around 2014 is there was a massive drop in commodity prices around the world. The price of oil plummeted largely because the U.S. pressured Saudi Arabia, which was very obedient at the time under King Abdullah before he died, and the U.S. pressured Saudi Arabia to massively overproduce oil, which made the price of oil in the global market plummet. And this was part of the U.S. strategy to weaken Venezuela. It was also part of the strategy to weaken Brazil's Workers' Party government, which led to the U.S.-backed coup against President Dilma Rousseff in 2016. And it was also an attempt to weaken Iran, which is heavily dependent on oil exports. And finally, on, it was an attempt to weaken Russia. And this is at the same time in 2014 when the U.S. backs the NATO, uh, the U.S. backs the, uh, the, well, the beginning of the kind of NATO, NATO proxy war in Ukraine in 2014 with the Maidan U.S. backed color revolution and then the violent coup in February 2014. In response, Russia annexes Crimea after a democratic referendum in which Western institutions admitted that over 90% of people in Crimea wanted to join the Russian Federation. They historically were part of Russia. And then in response, Western governments impose very heavy sanctions on Russia. So 
2014 is a massive cr crash in commodity prices, which does serious damage to the Venezuelan economy because it's heavily dependent on oil exports. And then in 2015, the Obama administration declares Venezuela a, an extraordinary and unusual threat to the national security and interests of the United States, which is absurd, as if Venezuela is going to threaten the American people in some way. And then in 2016, more and more sanctions going full on until 2019 when the U.S. appoints Juan Guaido as fake president and the full on embargo. So you can see that inflation increased at that time while Venezuela's international reserves decreased and which is the blue line in this graph. And then the green line shows imports drastically decreasing around 2013. And again, when that's that's where uh, Hugo Chavez dies. There's an election and, and Nicolas Maduro wins 2013 and then there's a crash in commodity prices. And so we see that there's a few things to keep in mind here. Venezuela historically has been dependent on imports, but especially with the oil boom when commodity prices were very high, when oil prices were skyrocketing in the mid 2000s, Venezuela was riding that wave and it was importing a lot of products, including food. So that's historically a problem that Venezuela has had for decades, for 100 years, well before Hugo Chavez was even born. And when it had neoliberal right wing governments, it had always been heavily dependent on food imports. So that meant that that as the oil boom happened and it was in the country, you can see there's it's not a coincidence that in the mid 2000s, when oil prices were high and it was riding the wave of the commodity boom, you can see that international reserves were increasing along with imports. So, of course, Venezuela is producing more and more oil and oil prices are high, which means that it's exporting. It's getting more money for its exports. So it has a massive current account surplus, which means that it has all of these this foreign currency, largely dollars, because oil is largely traded in dollars. So Venezuela's foreign exchange are filled with U.S. dollars. And that money is used to buy imports. And it's also used to fund social programs, building millions of housing units, free health care and education. But then, of course, the oil boom crashes around 2013, 2014. Oil production decreases. And that means that also international reserves decrease and imports correspondingly decrease. And then the sanctions are imposed. And that means that oil production decreases further, which makes it harder for Venezuela to get hard currency. And in order to one, pay for imports and two, in order to stabilize its currency, the Bolivar, the Venezuelan central bank needs foreign currency because let's say the Bolivar is depreciating, then the Venezuelan central bank could buy the Bolivar in foreign exchange markets with US dollars, taking dollars out of its foreign exchange reserves in order to, str to stabilize or strengthen the weakening currency. But then if oil production decreases because you can't export oil because of the U.S. sanctions. That means that not only is the government starved of revenue, but but it's all the central bank specifically is starved of foreign currency, which means it can't stabilize its currency. And then you also have this crazy currency war, which I don't have time to get into, where you have groups like Dollar Today, which are based in the United States and likely linked to U.S. intelligence. And they start spreading all of these fake exchange rates in the black market to push up the price of the Bolivar and just cause economic chaos. So the point that I'm getting at here with all of these graphs is that the U.S. has done so much economic damage, waging war on Venezuela. And now the Venezuelan economy is growing very quickly. It's in recovery. It actually has lower inflation rates now than other countries in Latin America because of the global inflation crisis. Inflation is largely under control. And Europe and the U.S. are basically begging Venezuela for its oil. So this is an incredible turnaround. And let's keep in mind that as recently as as just 2020 in April, the Trump administration did this insane stunt with Attorney General William Barr, who, by the way, is a longtime CIA asset in which here is the Justice Department official video on the YouTube account. Attorney General Barr and DOJ officials announced significant law enforcement actions related to uh, and they, it's cut off because it's long, but Nicolas Maduro and 14 current and former Venezuelan officials. They absurdly falsely charged Maduro and, and Venezuelan top officials with so-called narco-terrorism and corruption and drug trafficking. And the U.S. government 
put a $15 million bounty on the head of Nicolas Maduro, like, like a mafia lord. I mean, this, this is crazy. And now here we are where the U.S. and Europe are recognizing who the real president of Venezuela is because they need Venezuela's oil. This is an incredible turnaround. So just keep in mind that less than that, just two years ago, just over two years ago, the U.S. was quite literally trying to murder Maduro. And he, they tried they, they, in May, they had a failed invasion of Venezuela to try to overthrow the government. They put $15 million on his head. And now what's happening instead, John Kerry is shaking hands with Nicolas Maduro in Egypt at the UN Climate Change Summit. And no, it's not because the, the, jo the Joe Biden administration, the Democrats are supposedly socialists. Not at all. They're complete neoliberals. The Democratic Party is a right-wing party. The Republican Party is a far-right fascistic party. It's not because they support Venezuela. It's because they need Venezuela's oil to stabilize the global energy market. Quite an incredible turnaround in just two years. And I think there's a reason that President Maduro, in those videos I showed of him with Kerry, with French President Macron, and with the Argent, uh, excuse me, with the uh, Portuguese uh, prime minister, there's a reason that you can see Maduro smiling. He's smiling because he knows that Venezuela withstood the worst of the storm. The worst is over. It defeated the U.S. coup attempt, and it is going back to being a significant country in the move toward building a multipolar world. I'm Ben Norton. Thanks for listening or watching. If you support this work that I do, please consider going to patreon.com slash multipolarista. There's a, there'll be a link in the description below, along with the other uh, videos and podcasts that I mentioned in this episode. And I'll see you all next time.